Okay, we start a new chapter this morning. Turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. I've entitled this lesson, This is the Sum. This is the Sum, part one. When I thought about the way he begins this particular chapter, with this statement, now, of the things which we have spoken, which includes everything all the way back to Hebrews chapter 1, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. This, this, this is the goal. This is his design. <laughs> you got to remember, this isn't, this isn't, though Paul was the writer of this, this wasn't Paul's, this wasn't something Paul was pulling out of his mind. This is God's son. And I, you know, I, 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 didn't write, I didn't really write it in my notes, but I, I couldn't help but think about it. Why Solomon, when he brought uh, the book of Ecclesiastes to a close, after he had dealt with everything that was vanity, he said, uh, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. <laughs> and he says, Here's the conclusion of the whole matter. If you don't get, this, this is like making this statement. If you don't get anything else that I say this morning, get this. Christ is our great high priest. People say, what's the big deal? He's my savior. He better be your great high priest. A lot of folks I know, a lot of people I love and respect, a lot of people have been a big part of my life. Christ is indeed, according to their profession of religion, their Savior. But if you ask them or inquire them about Christ's work, his office as a priest, they're clueless. They're clueless. It, it, it astonishes me how people that have spent their entire lifetime, entire lifetime, from their childhood when they started in vacation Bible school until they're in their middle 70s and 80s, having to spent, what, 70 years in what they would consider a gospel church. Ask them, ask them some questions about the script. People look at us like we're crazy when, when you start talking about these things. It's like, it's like when... When we talk about atonement or reconciliation or the suretyship of Christ or substitution or imputation or election or predestination or sovereignty, any of these subjects that are the, the, the sum and substance of the scriptures, the conclusion of the whole matter, something that I don't have to venture very far to find, they look at, like, look at you like... You and I aren't reading the same book. And here's the thing. We aren't reading the same book. They're reading it as a book. And most people that I know in religion who have spent their whole lives in it, they, they religiously and dogmatically probably every year, you know what they do? They read through this book. How many times did you read through the Bible? I remember there was some old senator from New York, played Bill Bradley, I think was his name, played for the New York Knickerbockers. I remember him when I watched football, I mean basketball, when I was a young child. But after he got out and he became a senator, one of the things he did, he, he memorized. Can you envision it? And I memorized Romans 8. That was a task. 39 verses. He memorized the whole Bible, can he? And I thought, how in God's name do you memorize those names in 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles? Memorize it. And they said it was amazing. They'd memorize, you talk about a memory. could memorize the whole Bible in its entirety? What good does that do a man or a woman? If you know it, I mean, you might as well, might as well memorize Gone with the Wind or War and Peace. So you, you can read this book and not read this book. That's what I'm saying. 
If it does, if, if whatever you're reading in this book, if you're, and this is the thing we cannot do, and I, I hope and I pray by God's grace I don't do it, and never do, especially as a as a preacher of the God. I'm not trying to prove a point. We're not dealing in things that are speculative. This is not speculation. When I go into this book, and when you go into this book, you should go into this book looking at the Scriptures for one particular reason alone. Where is Christ? I want to find His person. I want to find His word. I will draw from a little bit from what we're going to preach in the Sunday Bible class hour because I'm not preaching it from that aspect, but in reality, to, to you and me, the child of God, wouldn't Christ be our pearl of great price? And shouldn't we have a desire to dig out everything we can about his person and his work? Don't you want to know more about him? Not more about how to live better, but know more about what he did for you. Everything else is speculation. If I can't back it up from this book, it's best to leave it alone. That really is. Paul's not speculating. The writer of Hebrews is not speculating about this, this sum of the matter. He has stated conclusively in seven full chapters that Christ, our great high priest, has satisfied perfectly and completely that which typified him in both the tabernacle and the priesthood and all the sacrifices and ceremonies of it. All of it combined offered no salvation unless it directed in your mind and your understanding to the sum. Do you see that? If it's not about Christ, if it's not about his righteousness, if it's not about his accomplished work, all that knowledge is just a waste of time. All of it. Now, this really, where we're at this morning here in chapter 8, Paul basically makes the second major division or section of the book of Hebrews. And what he does here in this chapter, and we'll see this over the next several weeks, and it'll take a while to get through this, just like it's taken a while to get through all the other chapters. What we see here is that he sums up what true believers, true justified saints, the elect of God, Christ's church, his people, what they actually possess in Christ Jesus their Lord. I, I cannot help but think about it. We receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Have you received that kingdom this morning? Are you part of it? Let me ask you this. If we, if we, and, and, and this, is, this shows why it's all of God's grace in its entirety. Folks, that's not speculation. We receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. <laughs> what kind of kingdom? Ain't got nothing to do with anything down here. It don't have anything to do with who's the president or who's the governor. It don't have anything to do with Jinping, whatever his name is, over in China. It don't have anything to do with cryptocurrency. It don't have anything to do with anything that, that hypersonic nuclear warhead that flew around this world that China sent out that nobody seems to know anything about. Done it twice now. That kingdom of this earth, it can be shaken, and it is shaken, and it is constantly in movement. Is it not? And I'll tell you what, ultimately, this, this kingdom of this earth this world and all that's included, all its leaders and all the ungodly. Our Lord God has told us what he's going to do with all of it. He's going to burn it off. Because ain't, listen, none of it is worth saving. None of it. And so for his children's sake and for his glory's sake, what's he going to do with all of it? I'm purging it. Burning it all up. Doing away with it. 
I keep, I keep reading about all these. Uh, uh, all, all, folks, I'm sure the temperature has gone up a little bit. <laughs> Maybe these people didn't grow up like I grew up. I can remember when it was hot when I was six or seven years old, if not hotter, back in the 60s than it is in this year. But we got to do something to save this place. I, that has become a religion in and of itself. We got to do something to save this. That's their problem. They want to save this planet. I could give I could care less about this planet. Huh? This ain't the kingdom that can be moved. Or it is the kingdom that can be. This is not the kingdom that cannot be moved. Which kingdom is it? It's the kingdom on which our Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns and dictates. It's that kingdom is talked about in Romans chapter 14. That the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But it's righteousness and joy and peace. Where? In the world, our Lord said, what? You'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. What? I've overcome it. You see the difference? And I know faith, faith faulty because I'm going to tell you what. I know what I'll do this afternoon just like you. I'll go home and I'll get on Liberty Daily and watch Fox News and get my mind filled full of all that malarkey. And I'll get troubled and concerned just like you do. And by God's grace, I hope he'll pull me back to the rock that's higher than me and get my mind off the things of time because of everything in this world, folks, it is going away. All of it in its entirety. We actually have some. Look, you and I as justified saints have something that can never be taken from us. I'm grateful that I have money in the bank. Aren't you? We spend our whole lives working to put back money for retirement, don't we? And we're careful with it. And we have a tendency, we seem to think, you know, because they these financial planners tell you, you know, they say, in order for you to successfully retire at your current your current level of living, you need X number of dollars in the bank, right? One, at least a million dollars. You know, everybody trying to get to a million dollars. What a million dollars? A lot of money. I got to get to a million dollars where I can retire comfortably. Even as justified saints, you know, we have a tendency to put our comfort in. We look at how many zeros are on our bank account or in our retirement program. And folks, I'm gonna tell you what: that stuff can evaporate in a moment. What happens if in this hour, while we're here this morning, the world economies collapse? And when the world economies collapse and the stock market crashes and they lock the doors on the banks like they did back in the Great Depression, and you can't get to a dime, where's your hope then? Don't trust what you got. Now be thankful for it, but don't trust it. Trust in this. I've been young, and now I'm old, and I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Take hope in this. I will never leave you nor forsake. You. Even if my bank account's empty, yep. You know, I think about that, that I've been young. David said, I've been young, I've been old, not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. You know who comes to my mind there? What about the Lazarus laying at the gate wanting to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table? He might have been poor and begging for bread physically, but he wasn't begging for bread spiritually, you see. The Christ said, I am the bread of life. You eat this bread, you drink this wine down here, and that's all you're eating and drinking, it, it goes away. Your, your fathers ate bread in the wilderness. They ate the bread and angels' food, what happened to every one of them. He said, you eat this bread, you will never die. 
I don't know about you, that's comforting me. Especially as filled with unbelief as I am. They say, oh, don't say that, Pat. That's just the truth. And see, th this is where he shows us here how that the Lord Jesus Christ, in both his person and his atoning, reconciling work, folks, he is the absolute, complete fulfillment in time of all that that old covenant typified and foreshadowed when it comes to matters of eternal salvation. All those Old Testament saints that were the elect of God under that old covenant, they saw through these pictures and types who? The Lord Jesus Christ. How do I know that? You say, you, you can't know what them folks knew. Yeah, I can. Because he's told us. Let's do this. These all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. How can you see Christ this morning? How, can, how do you see Him as the Lord you're right? You feel something? Is it something emotional or ethereal? Something mystical? No. What is, it's, it's a fact that He's revealed to me. How do, how do you embrace that fact? By the faith that He gave you. They saw it afar off, and listen to this, not only did they see it, they were persuaded. They were convinced. How? Well, they had enough facts. No, who, it comes down to this, who convinced them? <laughs> and that's one of the things that I take great assurance in. I can tell men and women all the facts of the Scriptures, but I can't convince you of them. But if he convinces you, he persuades you. Ain't no man or woman can unpersuade you. I don't even think that's a word, but ain't nobody can persuade you. That's the difference between, between being taught of God and taught of man. I've had so many people through the years tell me, well, you think it's something you can learn like math. No, I don't. I, I wish it was something you could learn like math, but it's not. I mean, we, we all went through that math principle where we started off, and we're working on it now with Zoe, with a little bitty small basic numbers, you know. One plus one, two. Two plus two, four. Three plus three, six. You know, a little small thing. And I can remember being, as a, 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 when I don't remember, I can't, I'm not going to say I can remember my childhood going through that. I can't. But I can remember when my boys were growing up, I can remember back that far. Spent not, not so much with Matt, but with Jeremy. That, that was frustrating. Trying to get that boy to add. And when we got, I, I don't know if they still do it in school now, but when, when uh, they got to that thing to where they had to learn the states, the 50 states and the capitals, I thought I was going to lose my mind. You know, and we, it, was just, it was a constant drumbeat of renewal and trying to relearn all those things and then the test and do it again and do it again and do it. And I bet you, I thought at one time when I taught both of them, helped both of them go through that program, I knew all 50 states and I knew all 50 capitals. But I bet you now, I don't know all 50 states and I don't know, I certainly don't know all 50 capitals. Because just like I used to could play the piano, that's a good country word. I, I previously could play the piano and took lessons for six to eight, ten years because I don't practice the piano. If you told me to sit down, I can do chopsticks is about all I can do. And I could play classical music 25 years ago. I could, I could play Tchaikovsky. I could do all that big time. But at 18, I knew the eight, I could play the 1812 overture by, by, my, by memory. Now I couldn't play anything. But when it comes to the Word of God, we can put all the facts out there, but unless the Lord enlightens you, He gives you eyes to see, ears to hear, heart, heart mind, will, and understand and perceive, you can't see any of it. They, they persuaded, embraced, embraced something they hadn't seen. It said of Moses that he placed in God who was invisible. 
that you cannot see. Embraced and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. This is a couple of, this is several hundred years before the Lord Jesus Christ ever came. And yet they embraced the promise. Again, his emphasis in this summation is the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ's righteousness alone, it entitles believing sinners to the whole inheritance of eternal life and glory. So what Paul is doing here is he's showing these believers that they don't need anything else. Because see, that's what they've been being told. You don't have a temple. You've been shut out of the temple. Many of them had been excommunicated. Because see, that was the thing. When you confess Christ and you identified with Christ's church by believer's baptism, the first thing they did is they, they blotted you out of the temple group. You was a dunner. Finished for you. You're not welcome back. But now they're encouraging them. Look, come on back. Come on back. Because you don't have a temple. You don't have a priest. You don't have a sacrifice. And like we have said for many, 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 many years now, they were correct in this. They said, you can't worship God because you don't have these things. And they're correct, are they not? In order to worship, what do you got to have? You got to have a high priest. You got to have a sacrifice and you got to have an altar. And physically, in this world, those Jews are right. They did not have a physical altar. They did not have a physical sacrifice. They did not have a physical high priest. So, therefore, to their minds, they had concluded, unlike us who can worship God, which, which God were they worshiping? Who was Caiaphas worshiping? Ananias, the great high priest. Who were they worshiping? Uh, they called him Jehovah, but who were they? Who did our Lord say that they were worshiping? You of your father, the, the devil, right? So they're saying, you're not worshiping God like us because you don't have these things we've been taught all our lives that we got to have. And Paul's saying, yeah, you do. You got everything you need. He shows them they don't need an earthly priesthood. That they don't need a tabernacle or a temple. They don't need a physical altar to attend to. And they no longer, you think about that. It, 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 back under that old system, there were some poor people. That's why, you know, when we started studying through Leviticus, well, which, which never concluded that study. One of these days we'll go back there. But for provisions for those who didn't have the money to buy a bullock or a lamb, couldn't even afford a turtle dove, there were provisions they could the meat, the, the grain offerings, the flour and wheat offerings, the, the cakes pounded fine, made with oil. Because that's what they could afford. But even that would be troublesome to try to come up with. I, that's why our Lord, when he said, Come to me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. Why? You've got to, you got to get a sacrifice. Right? You've got, to, you've got to earn your money, take care of your family, and then spend some of your money to provide for these things, to bring to the altar, to provide sacrifice for yourself and for your families. He's telling them you don't need any of these things. Why? We have such a high priest who's glorious in his person and his righteousness unlike anything that you or I could ever do enabled by whatever aid or agency including God and the Holy Spirit. His righteousness is so effectual and so powerful that we who believe by God's grace by the power of his Holy Spirit we who believe are Perfect and complete. <laughs> you want some good news this morning? And ye are complete in him. Every time I say that, I always think about it. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Huh? 
That is so wrong. Please don't teach your children and grandchildren that song. He ain't working on you to make you anything. He's made you the righteousness of God in him. Now you tell me, I know people say, well, you're a dead gum antinomian. You tell me how you can prove on that. What can you add to perfect righteousness by your obedience, assisted even by the Holy Spirit? What can you do, enabled to do it, add to that righteousness? Because I tell you, if it's something that can be added to it, that ain't righteousness. That's why this thing's so dangerous and deadly. That's why men and women have to be encouraged and warned and reproved and rebuked and told from the Word of God by God's people there is no life in any of that. There has never been life in the law. And that's what Paul's stressing to these people. Now notice what he says here in in verse 1. He tells them we have such a high priest. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest. We're not trying to get one. We're not accepting one. We're not making him our high priest. We, we all came from a religious background. All of us did. Where well-intentioned, though deceived and deluded men and, and women would stand up and tell you, won't you make Christ your Lord and Savior? You can't make him something that God Almighty's already made him. Philippians chapter 2. Go read. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God and equal with God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and became obedient unto death. Which death? Even the death of the cross. Therefore, For that cause, because he was willing to humble himself and become obedient unto that substitutionary death, the death of the cross, remove the curse. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him. Who did it? You ain't made him Lord. And nowhere in this book does it tell you to make him Lord. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You ain't made him Lord. He is Lord. That word Lord means what? Owner, master. How much does he own? He bought all of it, Kenny. All of it's under his control. By him, we all, even the poet said that, Paul said. Remember on the Mar- Mars Hill? Even as your poet said, in him we live and move and have our very being. Everybody. The most vile, vicious person that you could ever possibly imagine on this life. Why are they alive? Where does their life come from? Who makes their hearts beat? I hate to see anybody die from COVID the way this vicious disease has ravaged our country, but I heard our president say this week, trying to defend the position, he said if, if he hadn't have taken the vaccine, he would have died sooner. No, he didn't die at the later period because he took the shot. He died at the moment he was supposed to die. And I tell you, you will too, and I will too. You ain't going one moment, one nanosecond beyond what God has purposed and intended for you to go. I thought about that this week. You know, people say, you make that kind of a statement. They say, well, and you're just saying that if, if uh, you, know, you can take it and do whatever you want to and... God won't kill you. I didn't say that. Again, I've said this. I'll say it again. I'm not going to tempt, because this is tempting God. If I were to take it and say, I'm going to see if it's my day to die. 
and there's an 18 wheeler coming down out here on 167 at 65 mile an hour, 20 miles over the posted 45 mile an hour. And I wait to the last second and jump out in front of it. And it hits me. Now, I'm trying to I'm trying to see if it's my day. If it's if it if it is God's will for that to be my leaving this planet, Kenny, I'm gone. But it might be God's will, and it, if it and this might be the will of God too. As I've tempted God, when that truck hits me, it breaks me into ten thousand different pieces, and I lose my ability to talk and walk and blink and do everything except maybe them hook me up to ventilator and breathe and I spend the rest of my time in a hospital in a nursing home blinking my eyes trying to tell people what I need. But I'm telling you what, I ain't leaving until he says go. You cannot, you, and people say, well, that's just, that's just madness. That's just reality. Now either, we, either, either that's true or it's not. The scriptures are clear. The issues of life and death don't belong to you and me. Who do they belong to? See, he, he, in this chapter, in this verse that we're looking at here, verse 1, we have a, such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. The Apostle Paul continues in this chapter to deal with the heart of the difference between that old mosaic economy and the gospel economy. And he writes here that the sum of the whole is found where? In the perfection and in the glory of Christ's person. Where's our high priest today? Where's his place of residence today? Huh? Where, where does it say? He sat at the right hand of the throne of of the majesty in the heavens. Where's their high priest at? Oh, wait, they don't have a high priest anymore, do they? <laughs> uh, wait, hold it. They don't even have a temple anymore, do they? Christ warned them, didn't he? He told them, don't, remember when he was going out, they was carrying him out, and they sent their mourners out to mourn as they was carrying him to Golgotha? He looked at me and said, don't mourn for me. Who should you be mourning for? You mourn for yourselves. Because the time's coming with everything you see here. Our, our Lord was majestic. <laughs> he was no weakling. Huh? Even in his death, he was... King of kings and Lord of lords. In complete control of all his faculties. Never, even at his death, he was, he was still cognizant of everything that he did. And they didn't take his life. He gave up the ghost. When he had completed the work, he said, it's finished. And he bowed his head. He didn't... It didn't he bowed his head like a majestic king, and he gave up the ghost. Why? He had said, no man takes my life from me, what I do. I, I give it. I give it what I'll do. I'll raise it up again. But he tells them, don't weep for me. You weep for yourself because everything that you value, everything that you look to, everything that you put your hope in, what's going to happen to it? It's all going away. And we're within a few years of that happening. And when it went away, folks, it went completely away. Solomon's temple in all its majesty raked to the ground. That dude that did that, sadly he's not here. I always used to attribute it to Antiochus Epiphanes, but it wasn't. It was some other dude. I don't know if Sally's not here to tell me. I wish she was because I can always look at her and she'll mouth the word. But whoever that dude was that did it, he was so angry toward those Jews, he said they raked the ground, Kenny, where it was at to where there was nothing left. Now where's your hope? That's why it's called the wailing wall for them because they, they wailing because they got nothing. Everything, you think about it, everything you value, you value your whole life, everything your mom and dad and grandma and great-grandpa and hundreds of generations before said, these are the ways that we approach our God. Gone. 
and yet we have a sanctuary. And we have one that's seated in the sanctuary. And the folks, he's the minister in that sanctuary. And he's the sacrifice that he had to offer in that sanctuary. That word translated some, it means the chief, our main point, or the principal thing. Here's the principal thing. This is the thing that you and I need to learn. We have, present tense, we have such an high priest. Who is he? he? Paul identifies him. He doesn't leave it in the dark. Who is he? He's God the Son incarnate. He's the second person of the Trinity who is set on the right hand of the majesty on high in heaven. And this high priest, folks, he's over all flesh, all of it, specifically for the eternal blessedness of his sheep. Folks, everything in this world, Satan included, they are God's pawns to move around for his glory for your good as his children and for the advancement of his kingdom in this present evil world till he returns. Now, don't feel that way, does it, to us? And shame on me, shame on you for ever doubting me. It ain't out of control. I, we, we, we make those kind of statements, don't we? It's just, it's just out of control. And I, I, I try to calm myself and calm others. It's not out of control. Everything's happening exactly like it's supposed to happen. One old Arthur put it this way. He said, the grist mill of God's justice turns slow. But it grinds fine. And folks, it's, it's just turning. We're working toward the end been working that way since the end of days began the end of the age started when he when he when he cried it's finished that end of that age began and we're living it we're in the millennial reign of our we're we're, we're kings and priests we've been made kings and priests of our god in this present world let us act like it that doesn't mean arrogant and haughty Look down our nose self-righteously at others. What are we? We're, we're humble servants. Right? He's the one who in, is in an eternal, unchangeable position. Our great high priest is in an un, eternal, unchangeable position of inconceivable power and majesty in order to continue to discharge all the duties of his mediation as the surety and representative of all his people, all of it according to God's grace. And we'll close with this this morning. We have to make a proper distinction here respecting Christ's person. Because think about this. His divine nature is the second person of the Trinity, is God the Son is exalted. And it's always been exalted. Glorify me. Listen, this is our Lord in his high priestly prayer. Glorify me with the glory which I had with thee before the world began. That, that divine person, and I cannot, listen, this is deep. <laughs> This, this is way above my pray grade, but I'm going to try to put it as plain and simple as I can. That divine nature had, that Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's, it's not exalted, this, his divine nature is not exalted by any addition to it, but only by way of manifestation as he reveals himself to us. Christ as to his divine nature, folks, he's always been sitting on a throne. He abdicated that throne to step out of eternity into time to do this work and humble himself. And this sovereignty is an, ins is inseparably prop an inseparable property of his divine nature. And on the other hand, in his human nature, which is his body and his soul, that which he took into union with his divine nature, that human nature, it is capable and was capable of additional glory is humanity. 
You think about it, his humanity, that holy thing, created in the womb of the Virgin Mary, taken into union with his divine nature. It has power and authority over this whole universe. Listen to you. I wrote these two verses into my note. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. That word learn means to increase one's knowledge by use and practice. Our, learn, our Lord learned obedience. As God didn't learn obedience as the eternal Son of God, but as man, God man. And then I thought about this one. Remember when our Lord was a child? It said of Him. This, this, this is said of this this divine this human nature, because His divine nature, He knew everything. I mean, you think about this, because I, I, I think about it a lot. When when He was in that manger. Because the scripture said, by him all things consist. Is that babe in that manger? Our Lord upheld this universe. But this is amazing. This one who upheld the universe, he had to learn to walk. He had to learn to talk. He had to learn how to eat and feed himself and clothe himself. He had to learn all those things. And we know that to be the case because the scriptures tell us. Listen to this. It, in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says this. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. As the eternal Son of God, He always pleased the Father. Being equal and co-eternal with the Father. But as he grew in wisdom and stature, as he prepared himself for, to be that great offering for sin, is our great high priest in his sinless humanity, he grew in wisdom and favor before who? God and man. How do we know he grew in, in favor before man? They looked at him and said, how is it that this man knows what he knows and he doesn't have letters? He doesn't have a degree. He <laughs> hasn't been to seminary. And folks, yeah, this is just another pledge of the perfection, absolute perfection of his sac sacrifice. It's got to be perfect because that's where we get our assurance from. His sacrifice is absolutely and completely perfect. Now we'll stop right there and we'll come back next Sunday. I appreciate your presence. You're dismissed.